Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway and welcome to another review. Up to date I'm going to be reviewing quite a modern British diesel from Hornby. Today's locomotive is one that I have never tried before, so it's always very exciting to try a new locomotive for the first time. Also, in real life, this locomotive is still in service, which is quite rare for the things I review. So, the locomotive is this. It is the Hornby Class 60. And as I understand it, this is quite a modern and quite a detailed locomotive, so hopefully this will be up to modern standards. It's certainly very expensive. The ROP on Hornby's website for this very model is £217.99 which suggests that this isn't some sort of ex Lima or 30 year old model just dressed up in modern packaging. Hopefully this will be actually a modern locomotive with modern features. Fortunately, I did not pay anything close to that ludicrous price because Hattons did like a special on these and I managed to pick it up for 124 pounds, nearly 100 pounds less than Hornby would charge you for it on their website. So I definitely don't recommend paying nearly 220 pounds for this. The typical retailer price is 160 to 180 pounds, which certainly seems a bit more reasonable, but still quite a lot of money. So I think in order for this model to justify that, it's gonna have to be quite impressive. It is gonna have to be modern and it's going to have to be decent quality as well. So let's find out whether it is, let's get it out and let's take our first look. So I must say, I do quite like the livery on this. Apparently the load hall livery is one of the lesser seen Class 60 liveries. So I like that. It's also a named locomotive, which is, you know, I'll, I'll take that over an unnamed one. However, if you are in the market for a Class 60, there is quite a bit to choose from in terms of the liveries, a few different versions of it currently available. So if you're interested, I will pop an affiliate link down in the description for you. For now though, more information on this one. Let me show you the end of the box. So the one I've managed to get is R3657. It is a load haul Coco diesel electric class 60 and the name is John Loudon McAdam and it is number 60070. And if I show you the back of the box, there's even more information. So route availability seven, that explains where the locomotive could travel on the network. In the middle, you've got quite an extensive history on the locomotives themselves, although I wouldn't necessarily recommend reading it because going by the first line, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It says, the last mainline diesel locomotive type built for British. What does that mean? Presumably that's supposed to say British Rail, but because it's Hornby and they're famously terrible at proofreading things, this has gone out to the public in that state. Anyway, at the end, you've got a diagram here. These are Hornby's diagrams used in the model design. Oh, and they are dated 2005. Wow, so this is getting on for 20 years old. Blimey, so older than I expected and certainly older than anybody would expect, at, you know, nearly 220 pounds, the design that is. Um, but having said that, 2005, early 2000s, that was a good era for Hornby. A lot of Hornby's models were very detailed in that era and mechanically they were very strong as well. So mm, alarm bells not ringing completely, but I am surprised that it dates back as far as that. Anyway, well, let's find out whether it is any good then. Let's take this sleeve off. Oh, and there is the logo. <laughs> Livery looking completely different. Look at that. Totally different. It looks, I think the white balance on this image must be a lot cooler for some reason. Yeah, looks almost entirely different. The roof here is blue on the image, whereas it's the same gray as the upper body. So yet again, locomotive in the box, looking completely different to the one shown on the box. Uh, but I don't like this any less. Class 60 experts, is this more accurate than shown on the box? Or is the box more accurate? I suppose that's the important question. Anyway, I have to say, speaking of the box, it does seem extremely heavy. Very, very heavy. It's a large diesel, of course, but even so, yeah, it feels heavy. So I will get this on the scales and let you know how much it weighs. Let's just hope it's got a mechanism that is able to <laughs> drive such a heavy loco. Okay, Class 60, Operating and Maintenance Instructions. Generic information on the front. Let's see if there's any info on the chassis. Uh, a little bit, so accessories, fitting. It looks like we've got kinematic couplings on this. 
yeah, fitting the detail to the buffer beams. It looks as though we've got screw link couplings, which are great. Body removal. They mention the extreme weight of the locomotive in this section and then go on to explain that the body is just clipped on. Given that you'll be lifting this locomotive by the body, you'd think screws would be a much more secure way of fitting the body, but um, obviously not. Lubricant, yeah, it shows you where to lubricate axles and also the worm drive, and that shows that this has a relatively modern setup inside. It looks like it's going to be dual drive shafts and therefore all-wheel drive, so that's decent. And there's another look at the chassis. It looks like it's got an 8-pin socket inside, and it uh, looks like there's a speaker fitted there, although Hornby don't usually do that, so I guess that's just there to represent a speaker or where you would put a speaker. But we'll open it up later on. There might be a speaker in there. I might be surprised. And then on the back, nothing that much of interest. Okay, so let's get cracking then, shall we? Let's take our first look. Must say, they have, they have taken some precautions against the extreme weight of this loco. We've got a single piece of foam here at this end. <laughs> Not at the other end, so I uh, don't know why, but I'll be able to find some use for it, I'm sure. Put it under one of my knees. So, accessories. Now, according to the instructions, these things, these big things, are snow plows. I don't think I would have figured that out otherwise. Um, they're not NEM fitted ones, uh, so it does look as though you actually have to sort of properly fit these to the model. Uh, we've also got properly moving screw link couplings. Again, 2005 this model dates back to. Even Hornby's latest locos don't always have those, so that's great to see. Uh, separately painted pipework included in there as well, and of course the couplings, I don't know if I already mentioned that, the NEM ones, that is. So not an awful lot to do yourself, it seems most of the detail is pre-fitted. Right, I've got to say, even through the packaging, you can see just how detailed this loco is. <laughs> the, uh, the horns have broken through the plastic, and they're holding it on. <laughs> okay, wow. Crikey, look at this thing. Yeah, I mean, the finesse in the level of detail is clear to see straight away, isn't it? Look at this thing. Yeah. Finish is a little bit flat, a little bit plasticky. You'd probably expect that for a model that dates back this far. Um, but yeah, I guess that's fairly standard. Okay. Oh, yeah. Wow. This is a weighty beast, that is for sure. But it's also a fantastic looking beast. I can see straight through the grills on the side. Uh, in fact, I can see the uh, the mechanism, the actual model mechanism <laughs> through the ones on, well, on your left-hand side. Um, but yeah, etched grills, that's a great modern feature. The livery looks awesome, and uh, clearly the detail elsewhere looks absolutely wonderful as well. So yeah, it looks as though expensive as this loco is, you certainly do get what you pay for in terms of the features and the level of detail. So I'm really looking forward to getting a close look at this. Hopefully, I won't live to regret what I've just said. But first, let's have a bit of a slideshow and let's hear a little bit more about the Class 60 in real life. The British Rail Class 60 was a heavy freight cocoa diesel electric introduced for the first time in 1989. Exactly 100 of these monstrous 129 tonne diesels were produced over around four years. This class came about as a result of a certain unreliability in the existing Class 56 locomotives, which were causing problems in all kinds of ways. As a result, British Rail made a rule that newly ordered locomotives must have a reliability of no less than 95%. A very high target, in fact, and I don't think any of their locomotives were meeting it at the time. Uh, but if they did manage to meet it, then that would save a significant amount of money by cutting out all of the delays and the extra work caused by the more unreliable locomotives. Now, several locomotive builders put in suggestions and bids in order to accept the challenge, and the winner was Brush Traction, and an order for 100 Class 60s was placed. 14 months later, the first engine was completed and entered the testing phase, where exactly the kind of problems British Rail were trying to avoid, of course, manifested. An estimated 100 faults were discovered, although I suppose this was to be expected to an extent with a new design, However, it took two years for these issues to be fixed, and the contract was almost cancelled in the process. But eventually, things did improve, and by 1993, all examples had been accepted into traffic. Following privatisation, the class was controlled by EWS, now DB Cargo UK, and GB Rail Freight purchased 10 examples at one point, DC Rail more recently purchased a small number of them, 
And while the class is still used today, only 29 are currently in service. The first example has even already been scrapped and this took place in 2020. So there it is up close and personal, the Hornby Class 60. And the level of detail is absolutely mind-blowing on this. In 2005, this literally must have blown people's minds because seriously, the level of detail here is better than many diesels that we've seen released in recent years. That's assuming, of course, that this hasn't been upgraded since 2005. I guess Hornby could have done some upgrades on it, but I'm not aware of anything like that. I mean, if you are, comment down below. But seriously, given the age of this model now, given the age of the tooling, the level of detail is absolutely insane. And I think when you consider the complexity of the model, the actual build quality isn't too bad either. Most of the parts seem to be nice and straight, and there is an absolute minimum of visible glue. However, the overall quality of the model isn't that impressive, to be honest with you. And I think we'll start with that, because besides this, it's going to be a very, very positive review. But the model is quite plasticky. The finish of the bodywork here is incredibly flat, and it's hard to imagine the real thing looking this flat. I mean, if it got dirty and weathered, then yes, I suppose it wouldn't be shiny metal anymore, but then the livery wouldn't be this clear, would it? So quite plasticky and also some of the detailing is plasticky as well i mean these handrails for instance on the cab doors uh, these are just plastic and quite flimsy so that's not great the loco is also not very stable on its bogies as you can see the body rocks like this note that the wheels are not moving when i rock the loco it is just the bogies and the body so not dreadfully stable and the bogies themselves are not very robust. You can see that if I apply a little bit of pressure to them, they move completely. And I think one of them, is it this one? One of them is broken, yeah. So that it's actually flexing and moving as I'm touching it. So the quality is not amazing. I think for the price I paid for £124, given the level of detail, that's not a problem. But at Hornby's latest price of £217.99, I would expect a much better quality model. Even down to things like this nameplate, for 220 quid, you would want an etched version of that nameplate. The flat painted one just isn't really adequate at that price. But for me personally, I don't really have that complaint. Right, so let's talk about this model then. So first, the weight, 624 grams. That goes down as the third heaviest locomotive I have on record. And it's also the heaviest Hornby locomotive I have on record, beating the Class 56 by a few grams. The livery and the decoration, besides the flat finish, is very good. So you've got the load hall logo there, that looks fine, doesn't it? Nice and crisp. You've got quite a few areas where two different colours join on the bodywork, and that is all decently done as well. Although the finesse in these orange triangles isn't that great, because clearly that's just been printed over the grey, and you can still see the grey behind it, but uh, it's not that noticeable. The yellow ends, yeah, that's quite well done. The lining is all very good, even though it passes over quite a few detailed parts. Yeah, no problem at all. So the livery and the decoration, that gets a tick as far as I'm concerned. Let's talk about the level of detail then, because it is insane, as I keep saying. So the grills, these do seem to be separately fitted. Whether they're actually etched metal or not, I'm not sure, but you can see detail behind them. And the back grill here, or the front, depending on your position, uh, that is completely see-through. You can see inside the body. You can see the loco mechanism, but I think they have put some detail inside there as well, so that it's more realistic. So that is absolutely amazing. And you've got more of this sort of thing up on the roof as well. These grills all seem to be separately fitted. And the depth you get as a result of that is so much better. I can't express how much better these look than just the moulded effects that you get on a standard body. And that goes down to even these small grills. These seem to be separately fitted. And of course, you've got the big exhaust area here, which again seems to be really finely moulded, separately fitted and separately painted. And I guess while we're up on the roof, I'll show you the horns. Nice fine little horns actually, yeah, fairly realistic. Separately fitted of course, and they do seem to be quite sturdy. So now let's move to the front of the Loco and work our way back. So you've got full glazing, which is nice and flush with the outside of the body. Little wipers fitted to the front, incredibly fine ones at that. So that's quite impressive. I assume this Loco will have full lights and it certainly looks like it does from the outside. More on that later on. 
The buffer beams are admittedly fairly bare as standard, although there is full detailing to apply to those if you'd like to. Although, of course, they will interfere with the coupling here, the tension lock, if you decide to fit it. And those tension locks go into kinematic couplings, but already I can see that they're going to be a lot of fun. Because even without the couplings fitted, you can see that they're not returning to the centre, so that's not very good. And the model even has a sort of rudimentary snowplow pre-fitted, which is good. The alternative ones in the accessories bag did not have the hole for the coupling to fit through. Uh, so I assume you'd have to remove the kinematic coupling in order to fit those. One amazing feature is the cab doors. They look fantastic, they look very realistic, but they also open. <laughs> Completely pointless feature, of course, but just the kind of thing that is so impressive to see. Um, I mean, they spring as well, so they don't stay open. It really is just a bit of a fun feature, but amazing to see, nevertheless. Sprung buffers, yeah, we've got metal separately fitted sprung buffers, that's great, and an incredibly realistic and detailed cab interior which is fully painted, it's got all of the seats, all of the controls and the gauges are fully picked out. It is one of the greatest diesel cabs I've ever seen. Like I say, this puts a lot of modern releases to shame. It really does, it's amazing. So even though the bogies are really sort of flimsy and not fitted properly, the detail on them is exquisite. Yeah, loads of separately fitted parts. You've got ladders, pipe work, all of the axle boxes and the springs are nicely molded. Yeah, it's just absolutely spot on, isn't it? And I think the most detailed area of the Loco is the underframe. I mean, there's all sorts of decoration and detail on it, but on the left-hand side, just look at this assembly here. The amount of detail and fidelity in these parts is just absolutely crazy. You can see that motor there as clear as day. So, so incredibly fine. Yeah, the level of detail is absolutely wonderful on this Loco. To the point where I worry that it's not going to run well. Normally, when I'm super impressed by a locomotive on the outside, on the inside, it tends to let me down. So, with some trepidation, I'm going to test this loco, then we'll take a look at the mechanism, and hopefully it continues to be a very, very impressive model on the inside as well as the outside. Well, we're going to find out now. So, let's go and take a look. So there she is, the absolutely fantastic looking Hornby Class 60 down onto the track. Now I've already filmed the first performance test and I will show you that in just a second. Next though, I did a bit of a deep dive to take a look at the mechanism. And to sum things up, uh, I called it, unfortunately. The relatively suspect quality continues onto the inside of the Loco. And to be honest, when a Loco weighs as much as this, this is a very, very heavy beastie, you'd expect the mechanism to be, if anything, more robust than normal. And in fact, it is less so. So let's take a look. Not a big fan of this design, I'll be honest. There are no screws holding the base keeper plates in position. Instead, they are held with clips, which are positioned exactly behind the wheels, which means for servicing and maintenance purposes, you can't just ease these clips apart uh, one by one and then gently lift off the base keeper. Uh, you just can't get to them. So in order to get a look under mine, I actually had to manhandle it quite significantly with a flat bladed screwdriver. And of course, that did break some of the clips. Uh, so it's a poor quality design, not very maintainable, but there's probably a good reason why Hornby don't want you removing these bases, and that's because the quality of the mechanism underneath them is very poor. No bearings at all. The axles just sit straight onto a plastic bogey chassis. And if I remove one of the axles, you can see that the axles sit into square slots. So you've got a metal axle, exerting all of that weight and all of that force onto an impossibly tiny point on just a plastic chassis. What a terrible quality design. I'm absolutely shocked at Hornby for that because they're normally really, really good for mechanisms. You can see though that we have a pickup going to each of the wheels, so it should at least have good continuity with the track. Now the body removal was worryingly easy given how heavy the chassis is. Again, not very secure. It was easy, except for the fact that you've got these wires in the way. These are the wires for the lights. So they are wired, they don't have spring-loaded contacts, which just disconnect when you remove the body. Instead, you've got to undo these plugs, but at least they are not hardwired like they were on the, was it the 56? So you can unplug them. So yes, we have got lights, just a pair of LEDs at each end of the model. I think that's fair enough. And removing the body, you can see that there are some details behind the grills. 
quite impressive that I have to say that is uh, quite amazing you've got the PCB here with the 8 pin socket on it so quite outdated they haven't updated that socket unfortunately I can't get a good shot of the motor I don't fancy disassembling this anymore quite frankly um, but it it's under here and uh, it's very large it's quite a substantial motor and you can see that it also has two absolutely massive flywheels bear in mind though the larger the flywheel the harder it is for the motor to turn them and of course more of the energy outputted by the motor has to be wasted on turning those flywheels than actually accelerating the rest of the loco there might be a reason why i'm mentioning that and then the gauge comes in at about 14.2 millimeters quite reliably across each axle so no major issues there so yeah, the mechanism's not bad. The motor seems to be fairly substantial and whatnot, but the bogey design is just poor, in my opinion. Not particularly good at all. But the performance itself is okay. So let's roll the performance test. Okay, finally then, let's find out whether this Loco's performance is as impressive as its level of detail. So forwards direction, does the Loco actually work? Let's find out, here we go. Oh, it started very slowly. I turned it quite quickly up to 50 and uh, it was very, very sluggish. But then it seemed to recover very quickly. So I guess it's just been sat in its box for a little while and uh, now it's sort of overcome that stiffness. So let's, let's go past at 50% speed. It is working. That's the main thing. Uh, let's take a look. So there you go, that's 50 speed. Now this is a, a slow freight locomotive, so I think that speed seems to be quite reasonable. Yeah, they, these are not supposed to be racing along. Uh, let's see what the crawl is like though. Bear in mind it has not been running yet. I still need to do that before drawing a final conclusion, but how is the crawl? Turning it up slow. Oh yes. So quite impressive. Um, it seems to be fluctuating in speed a little bit at the moment, but hopefully that's just because it was probably made quite a while ago and it's just been sitting in its box without running. Hopefully actually running the loco for an hour or so should improve it. But to be honest, that slow speed is pretty good. It is fluctuating a bit, but it's not cogging really, I would say. Uh, it seems pretty smooth. And at the higher speeds, it's very quiet, I have to say. There's no sort of mechanical grinding or anything like that. No, it seems to be really nice and smooth. Uh, the lights are working. It is on analog, of course, so they're not ultra bright. Uh, but we have got red tail lights and sort of cool white headlights, which is fair enough. Um, cab lights, I'm not seeing any lights coming on in the cabs, which is a shame because it would be nice to show off some of that lovely detail. But uh, alas, I think it is just those uh, two lights I've just described. Uh, so perhaps the lighting, yeah, I think that's a little bit outdated. But that's got to be the only thing about the model that is. I mean, it really is exquisite apart from that. But let's see how it handles the track work, shall we? Let's send it around. Hopefully this heavy, heavy loco will not derail or anything on my layout. And if not, then we can say it's a perfectly stable runner. So here we go, 50%. Okay, oh blimey. Seems to be speeding up already. But uh, yeah, that was the dodgy bit, wasn't it? The tight curves. Running light, the loco has not struggled with those at all. It didn't slow down that I noticed. So that is looking pretty positive. Whether it will do the same once I've fitted those kinematic couplings and then connected it up to some rolling stock, that's another thing entirely. But hopefully that will be okay later on when we try it. But uh, for now, nothing to report. Seems like a decent runner. Good speed, nice and stable, no complaints. I'll be back in about an hour's time after this has run 30 minutes forwards and then 30 minutes backwards. And then we'll continue the review with some haulage testing. So don't go anywhere. I'll be back in just a sec. Okay, folks, we are back, and that is running in complete. And overall, yeah, that is a pretty decent performer right there. No derailments, no problems really, no cutting out or anything like that. I have noticed a few slowdowns. I think that the torque might not be the best on this Loco. I tried it running around at a bit of a slower speed at 30 or 40. Let's be honest, this speed is perfectly possible for a freight locomotive. 
and uh, it really, really struggled around the second radius curves, slowed right down to a crawl, definitely struggling, and then as soon as the curves were over, it picked up speed and went back to the same as it was before. And I suspect the reason is that the gearing isn't the greatest in here. It's such a heavy loco, and because it's geared to run quite fast, the lower speeds don't have a lot of power to them. And uh, the top speed of this loco in real life is 60 miles an hour. And if I run this past at um, 50 on the controller, 50% speed, I would say that's not far away from there. You know, which means, to, to me at least, anything above 50% on the controller is a little too fast. I mean, does this look like 60 to you if I hit it with full speed? Yeah, it just seems way, way, way too fast. <laughs> so yeah, if they'd have geared it to be a bit slower, I think it would have more torque at the lower speeds. And this is a heavy freight locomotive, slow freight. Uh, I think the lower speeds are much more important than the higher speeds. Um, but how is the crawl? I suppose that could explain why the slow speed uh, wasn't the greatest either. But yeah, as you can see, that is actually a lot better. Yeah, that's definitely better than it was. Cogging a little bit, I think, which is weird. Well, perhaps cogging isn't the word, but as you can see, it jumps forwards every, uh, you know, several times in the rotation. <laughs> it's not exactly a smooth movement, is it? But at the high speeds, it is. We'll go a bit faster. Yeah, see, it's very smooth there. So overall, I'm going to say this has a good performance to it. Yeah. This is performing well. I think we've seen better, and um, whether it's because of the gearing or because of the motors, we have seen locos from other manufacturers, a bit of a wobble there, uh, that do seem to be more powerful at the lower speeds. Um, and that wobble is weird. Yeah, like I said, well, I noticed noted that earlier on. It's uh, not particularly stable, but um, that's the first time I've actually noticed it wobbling while performing. Uh, so it's not a massive issue. I've also fitted a coupling now. Um, oh, I've actually got it the wrong way. I'll put it back on <laughs> backwards afterwards. So it should be that way if it's going to couple up to my freight. Um, yeah, the kinematic coupling, it seems all right. It does seem to be, that one at least, does seem to be retur returning to the middle. Uh, so I don't think that's going to be an issue. Ooh. Did get stuck there, having said that. No, I think it's... Hmm. We'll just have to see. Yeah, look, there we go. It's gotten stuck there now, hasn't it? Hmm. But then again, it's not going to be going that far in practice. So I've set up quite a big train, actually. Mixed freight, lots of different types of wagons, some of them pretty heavy. Let's go and couple up to them and see how she handles a load. I'll try and do it smoothly then. Let's try. Here we go. Right, it'll be interesting to see how that uh, coupling performs. I have to say, kinematic couplings uh, are okay in some cases. You know, I, I'm not. I think they are a bit, you know, overkill in many cases. But when they work well, they work well. It's just on a lot of the Hornby models that have them, they seem to get stuck quite easily. And of course, if they don't work absolutely perfectly, then obviously it's just better not to have them. So. We'll have to keep a close eye on that, and as long as it doesn't cause any problems, uh, I'm not going to mark it down for the slight stickiness. But, uh, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Anyway, it's moving them. Let's go at about 40 speed. We don't want to go too fast. Yeah, I think that speed seems about right. On the middle line, I've got my other super detailed Hornby diesel, which I assume comes from a similar sort of time. Uh, in fact, this one's running quite fast, actually. Yeah, I'm going to have to slow that one down. So that's the 56, if I'm not mistaken. Only a small a bit of a feeble train, actually, on that one. Apologies. Let's run that at about the same speed. And on the inside line, I've got something a bit more modern. I've got a Class 66. And there are plenty of other diesels in the siding, so see which others you can spot, and comment down below if you can spot the earliest one on the sidings, and I will pin the correct answer. Yeah, I think that speed looks good, so let's observe it around the curve. Yeah. So, yeah, it does slow down quite noticeably on the curves, and then quite strikingly speeds up again after them. 
So the torque is not the best. If you're gonna make a loco this heavy, it needs to have a mechanism that can cope with it. So proper bearings, that would definitely have reduced the friction in the mechanism. Better gearing to ensure that a lot of the motor's energy is converted into actual pulling power. And if all else fails, even a better motor. But to be fair, on anything wider than second radius, the slowdowns are much less noticeable. So, you know, if you've got third radius or wider on your layout, then the slowdowns are probably not going to affect you. And I don't know how this will differ on DCC. Perhaps there will be more power available to the motor on DCC. Not sure. But on analog, this is very much as it performs. But it's a beautiful model. Yeah, it looks fantastic running along. The level of detail is definitely not lost on it. It looks like a premium model as a result of that. Overall, yeah, it's a decent one, isn't it? And the fact that it runs pretty well is a big relief, definitely. Let's have some ratings then for the overall very, very impressive Hornby Class 60. So the level of detail is a very easy one, I think. It's got to be five star. Lovely decoration. The cabs are just absolutely insane. Masses of detail. Does have lights, etched grills with detail behind the grills, opening doors, and the list just goes on. Sprung buffers, of course, yeah, five star easily. Performance is actually okay. I mean, it's better, I think, than it was when I first ran it. Uh, the crawl is okay, not the best in the world, but pretty decent, I would say. It does run quite fast for a loco with a top speed of 60 miles per hour. I do think they would have gotten better performance out of this if they'd have geared it down a little bit to run a bit more slowly. But to be honest, the torque issues don't cause a problem at the slightly higher speeds, and it is hauling the pretty heavy train I've left for it uh, quite well. So it's a four-star performer. Maybe that's a little generous, but I think I'm going to stick with that. The pulling power is insane though, uh, yes there are slight torque issues but at 50% it hauls at 0.9 newtons which is around 50 coaches on straight and level track. Can't say fairer than that really can you? The mechanism though does lose a couple of marks, uh, first of all because of the lack of serviceability on the bogies, not a big fan of that design, not a long lasting design and also the lack of bearings. That could have been forgiven, but the square slots in the plastic chassis seems unnecessarily shoddy, in my opinion. So it does lose a couple of stars for that. Similarly, the quality gets docked a couple of marks as well. Again, the outer bogey design is not a sturdy one. They seem to be, well, one of them at least is loose and slightly broken. That way from the box, that didn't happen during my manhandling. Uh, you've got plastic detailing, such as the handrails, they're quite plasticky and flimsy. No screws holding the body on, they're just clips that are very easy to overcome. Yeah, I think the quality could have been better, to be honest. Same is true of the value for money. Now, at £217.99, that's the RRP, I would give this a two star. It's not terrible, I mean, it's not a one star value, because obviously you get an insanely detailed model but you also get a relatively poor quality mechanism and not the greatest performance for that money. So that would be two star. I think 160 to 180 pounds as a typical retailer price is getting closer to reasonable. I would give that three star. And the price I paid is more like a four star, 124 pounds. Would have been five if the mechanism was better. So I'm gonna split the difference and give it three. Yeah, it's, it's okay, but don't pay the RRP. It isn't a good value model at that price and they could and should have done better with it at that amount of money. However, that's a pretty decent score, I would say, 7.67 out of 10. Let's put that into the logbook then, and it is 11th place, not bad at all, just above the Backman Small Prairie and below the upgraded Hornby A1. Yeah, overall, a fantastic model. Given its age, given the age of the tooling, it's absolutely outstanding, isn't it? Mind-blowing. Well, folks, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that review. Yeah, the level of detail is definitely the big takeaway from this. Very, very surprised at just how good this Loco looks. It's very, very impressive. And so overall, I can recommend this uh, if you don't mind the issues with the mechanism and you can find one for a decent price. Then, uh, yeah, if you want a Class 60, uh, look no further than the Hornby one. It's very, very impressive. For now, though, I will just about do it for this review. I hope you've enjoyed it. I will see you very, very soon for some more videos. But I think that's all for now. So thanks for watching again, and I will catch you on the next one. All right. Cheers, everybody. Take care.